What would you like to sing? 426. 420. You like that one again? Okay. <clears throat> you girls are dependable. Yeah. That's great. So, I made it. And I'm still on my feet. Far away the noise of strife upon my ear is falling. Then I know the sins of earth be sad. Shall run. 
Isabel? 624. 624. <clears throat> you got it. 624. When upon life's pillows you are tempest tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise what the Lord has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. So amid the conflict, whether great or small, do not be discouraged, God is over all. Count your many blessings, angels will attend. Help and comfort give you to your journey's end. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Count your blessings, name them. Going once? Oh, almost. No? Okay. <clears throat> Going twice? Sadie? 814. 814. Can do some 814. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Don't fall off the wagon. We'll do the verse 1 and verse 3, and then we'll do the course once at the end. Are you ready? <clears throat> All right. Some of you, I know, you're going to get caught up in the moment. You're going to start the wonderful, matchless grace of Jesus, and then you're going to go, oop, i got to go back to verse 3. Hey, well, here we go. <clears throat> wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise be? Than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountains, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Broader than the scope of my transgressions, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Praise His name. <clears throat> Very good. Any other takers tonight? Mm, Tom. 625. 625. <clears throat> 625. <clears throat> <clears throat> Brightly beams our Father's mercy from His lighthouse evermore. To us, he gives the keeping of the lights along the shore. Let the lower lights be burning, send a gleam across the way. Some poor fainting, struggling seamen, you may rescue, you may say. Trim your feeble lamp, my brother. Some 
trying now to make the harbor in the darkness may be lost. Let the lower lights be burning, send a gleam across the way. Some poor fainting, struggling seaman, you may rescue you. Mrs. Daniel. 794, please. 794. And then Mr. Hobrick, where are we headed? 421. All right. 794, followed immediately by 421. <clears throat> and that'll do her. <clears throat> 794. <clears throat> Let's do it. <clears throat> Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. Whenever I am tempted, whenever clouds arise, when some give place to sighing when up within me dies i draw the closer to him from care he sets me free his eye is on the sparrow and i know he cares for me his eye is on the sparrow and i know he cares for me I sing because I'm happy, I sing because I'm free, for his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. 421, <clears throat> 421. <clears throat> Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life. Jesus, only Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Good job, gang. <clears throat> very good, very good. Open up your Bibles tonight to Nahum. I know. <clears throat> do, 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 do. <clears throat> ah, yes, the book of Nahum. <clears throat> Gang, what kind of announcements need announcing tonight? Yes, sir, Jim. Uh, this tomorrow is Nancy's birthday. Ah, yes, it is. <clears throat> Very good. What would be the most appropriate way to recognize the occasion? 
Well, she's on. She's watching on TV, I think. Ah. Mm. So you think we should uh, we should uh, sing now or on Lord's Day? Uh, yeah. Either one. Okay, let's you face the camera. One. You, I think that would be appropriate, Tim. Good idea. Uh, <laughs> What's that? Okay, well, we're, she's, uh, what? <laughs> so Tim's watching for her. Hang on. Well, <clears throat> very good. Any uh, other announcements tonight? <laughs> McHenry knows. <laughs> Never tease the man with the funny earmuffs. Tom. Joel Washington and I would like to thank all the ladies for coming to Pearl's deal. Oh yeah. Thank you for all of you guys helping her clean up and stuff. She said it made it really easy. Really Great. Good. Well, excellent. <clears throat> Good job. Good job, ladies. Well done. All right. <clears throat> yeah, that's super. <clears throat> Very good. Anything else going on tonight? Mike? Uh, softball practice this Saturday, 4 o'clock. Oh. And we'll all just meet at the um, track at Target Range. The Target Range track. If a better field opens up, we'll text you and let you know. But then we'll okay. switch it up. But for <clears> now, <throat> that's, that's where we're headed. The track. It's right behind Target Range School. Oh, behind Target. Okay, so so not over here. So go further down to Target Range Elementary. School. Yeah, there's a little, like it looks like an old country schoolhouse almost on the south side. And okay, <clears throat> very good, very good. All right, excellent. Four o'clock Saturday. Good, good, good. Practice. <laughs> right, exactly. When you have this much innate talent, right? Very good. Uh huh. Other uh, other announcements today? Anything else we ought to know? <clears throat> All right. Very good. Very good. <clears throat> He's thinking. All right. Very good. So, so she's not quite on yet. So if you want to save it until we'll she, save it. Okay. All right. Very good. Very good. <clears throat> All right. Well, let's do some Nahum. Nahum. It's not like that. It's no, not not like that. <clears throat> so I I know I know how many who hasn't wanted a great Bible study out of the book of Nahum, right? Right, exactly. I mean, people wait people go years without hearing without hearing that kind of good news. That's amazing. <clears throat> so Nahum is kind of a um, kind of a I don't know part and parcel, but it's a it's a companion, if you will, to Jonah, right? So Jonah happens about oh, 60 or so years before Nahum. And Jonah, of course, went to Nineveh, right? And while in Nineveh, Jonah preached what? Hellfire and brimstone, right? He said, 40 days and the city will be overthrown. He had his megaphone. He had his sandwich board. He walked from one end of the city all the way around and around. He's on every high soapbox and said, 40 days and that's it. Nineveh is going to be demolished. And uh, surprisingly, perhaps, the city of Nineveh repented from the king of the Assyrian Empire down to the lowliest peasant. Even all the animals were commanded to be in mourning. So they had to, they, mm -mm, they, they were all on a very strict diet and, uh, and there was sackcloth to be had and ashes were passed around and we we're all going to be miserable together and you're going to be miserable. Yeah, I don't know if you will lie, but you will do it. And, but as a result of their repentance, the Lord changed his mind, didn't he? He said, okay, you know what? I've seen them. And he said, go back. Yep. Nope. Okay. Destruction is off. You guys have averted it. Okay. Nahum shows up about 60 or maybe a little bit longer, maybe mm, almost 90-ish somewhere. Um, Nahum is about 660, um, whereas, well, I guess Jonah was a little bit farther than that. Jonah is about 100, right at 100 years um, 
before that. Nahum prophesies about 660 BC, and this is when, man, the Assyrian Empire is rolling. It is, uh, it's at the pinnacle of its, of its power and its influence, and so Nahum has the job of prophesying again, although <clears throat> this time indirectly to the city of Nineveh. Jonah had actually, of course, gone there. <clears throat> Nahum doesn't make the journey, but much of what he prophesies centers around the city of Nineveh and the Assyrian Empire. <clears throat> so, if we're to try and put Jonah in its historical context, it comes somewhere before the fall of Nineveh in 612, and it comes after the fall of Thebes, which, uh, uh, which the Bible describes as no Ammon, no Ammon in uh, chapter 3. Verse 8 through 10. Are you better, he says to Nineveh, <clears throat> than No Ammon, which is Thebes, which was situated by the waters of the Nile, with water surrounding her. Rampart was the sea, whose wall consisted of the sea. Ethiopia was her might. Egypt, too, without limits. Put and Lubim were among her helpers, yet she became an exile, went into captivity. Describes the destruction of Thebes. That took place in 664 B.C. <clears throat> so, somewhere a little bit after 664, a little bit before, 612, so somewhere probably in about the 660 to 650-ish B.C. area. See, and aren't you glad you know that now? Because you watch, that'll be on Jeopardy. And then you're going to be like, bam, I got that one. <clears throat> Don't forget to answer in the form of a question. <clears throat> right. It's difficult to place Nahum in its historical uh, um, context specifically <clears throat> because Nahum doesn't mention any kings. Now typically, we talked a little bit last week, <clears throat> the prophets would generally kind of put a little time signature in their, in their work <clears throat> saying, in the third year of so and so or the fifth year of such and such, I went this and the Lord spoke and such, this and that happened. <clears throat> there is none of that in, um, uh, in the book of Nahum. You get to, those are the only real um, touchstones as far as dates are concerned. <clears throat> so, in about 650-ish B.C., what's going on? Well, <clears throat> the Assyrian Empire, as I mentioned, is at its height. They're rolling. Nineveh's its influence stretches far and wide. The emperor, um, the most influential, the most powerful, was Ashurbanipal. <clears throat> and so he is ruling, and things are rolling, and it's all coming up roses for the Assyrian Empire. They continue to expand their influence, <clears throat> and, uh, and, and all is well. Except, <clears throat> well, they have a reason to be somewhat happy <clears throat> and confident. The city of Nineveh is in many ways a, uh, a I don't want to say prefigure, but it's like, uh, it's like Babylon 1.0. <laughs> and then <clears throat> Babylon is going to do the same thing, but even to a larger degree. <clears throat> so the cities actually even share a lot of characteristics, which is not surprising because I think I mentioned to you, Babylon was actually a, uh, a colony of Assyria. And so there's a difference between ancient, ancient Babel and then Babylon, the city that came later. This is the latter of those two. <clears throat> Babylon, the city, is actually a colony of the Assyrian Empire. And so they grew and became larger. And eventually, they're going to conquer the Assyrians. But at this moment, in about 650-ish BC, Assyria is at its height. Babylon is growing, <clears throat> but they've got a ways to go before they're going to be strong enough in 612 to conquer the city. <clears throat> Though they're starting to flex their muscles a little bit. The city of Babylon, we've talked about that to some degree before, just its scope and its, just the sheer size of the thing is hard to comprehend. That was really Nineveh 2.0, right? Nineveh is, the, is, is where that kind of thing, I don't know if it got its start there, but certainly Babylon is a, is a copy in many respects. <clears throat> the city walls of Nineveh, Nineveh is a large city to begin with, but the city walls, if you remember, there's Nineveh proper, and then there's about uh, two, is it, there's at least two, there might be a third, uh, other city that make up the larger area of Nineveh. Okay? But around the city Nineveh proper, the walls themselves are 100 feet tall. Okay? So <clears throat> if you put that into perspective, I always use the building next door, one, two, three, four, that's only 30 feet tall. Wow. 
That's 30 feet because each of those siding panels is an eight foot panel, so you can count them pretty easy up the top. One, two, three, about four. That's 30 feet tall in rough figures. <clears throat> Imagine three of those. 100 feet's a long ways. A long ways. I mean, that's a 10 story building. So there, I, we don't have any of those in Missoula that I'm aware of. 100 feet is a long ways up in the air. <clears throat> so the walls themselves are 100 foot tall. <clears throat> There's a moat around the walls because every good castle needs a moat, right? The moat <clears throat> is 150 feet wide and it's 60 feet deep. That's a lot of earth to move, right? You know, I've seen this in movies before. Where the guy goes to, to cross the moat with the pole. Maybe you've seen this, right? And, and so he gets a good running start, and he places the pole into the, into the bottom of the moat, right? And then just keeps right on. It's 60 feet deep. You're, you're not going to do that. You're not going to put a ladder down there, right, <clears throat> and get up the other side. 150 feet wide, <clears throat> and then every so often on the wall, there are towers that go up from the, the wall is wide enough, you can race three chariots around the top. So they can put th three chariots abreast on the top of the wall, and it's 100 feet in the air. That gives you some idea of the width that has to be at the base to accommodate the kind of stability for something that tall, right? <clears throat> so it's that big, and then um, at strategic places along the wall, there are towers that go up an additional 100 feet. This is not, and it sits on the Tigris River, right? So they have their fresh water supply, and, uh, and all is grand, right? Nineveh is said could withstand at least a siege of 20 years. That's a lot. That's a lot. <clears throat> Babylon is the same thing, but on a bigger scale, right? Same thing, but on a bigger scale. <clears throat> Both of them founded on a river, right? Of course, Babylon on the Euphrates River. Massive walls. I mean, <clears throat> they believed the bigger is better. Yeah, and they and they <laughs> they lived by it. <clears throat> okay. In uh, chapter one and verse three, it says the Lord is slow to anger and great in power. The Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In whirlwind and storm is his way. Clouds are the dust, the dust beneath his feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. Bashan and Carmel wither, those are mountains. Blossoms of Lebanon wither. Mountains quake because of him. The hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved by his presence, the world and all the inhabitants in it. <clears throat> um, who can stand before his indignation? Who can endure the burning of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. With an overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of its sight will pursue his enemies into darkness. <clears throat> he says, the Lord is slow to anger in verse 3, right? And that sounds a great deal like how God explained his character to Moses, right? The Lord is slow to anger, he said in Exodus 34, abounding in loving kindness, right? I mean, the Lord is patient, the Lord is kind, he's merciful, compassionate, and he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. The Lord is patient. The Lord is slow to anger. The Lord does abound in loving kindness. But the Lord is also not going to be played. Right? He's patient, but He's not going to be taken advantage of. And boy, it's hard sometimes for people to separate the two. They mistake His patience <clears throat> for, uh, for non-interest. Right? The Lord doesn't see. Oh, He sees. The Lord's judgment is not idle, right? It's just, the, their judgment is not asleep. The Lord knows, but He's patient. Don't mistake God's patience and His kindness for complacency. And what, this is a, it's a problem with human nature, but we can see it in Nineveh. Right? A hundred years ago, at the preaching of Jonah, they repented. What's changed? in the last hundred years? Okay, this time a large fish didn't burp up Nahum. There's that. Why did they listen a hundred years ago, but they don't listen now? 
when Nahum prophesies, when he tells when he tells um, when he tells Israel this is what's going to happen. Why don't? Because he prophesies to um, the northern nation of Israel is gone, but to the Israelites, to, to Judah, he prophesies to them about what's going to happen to, to Nineveh. Why doesn't Nineveh, they don't, by the way, I'll, I'll fill you in, they don't repent this time. They don't change their ways. Why not? Maybe Jonah was a more eloquent speaker. Think that was it? Okay, that was an easy one. That's, that's not it. Maybe, uh, <clears throat> maybe, why not? Why don't they listen this time? What do you think? <clears throat> Matt? Give it a different generation of people. Yeah, <clears throat> for sure. Their mindset might be different. Yeah. Different group of people. <clears throat> yeah. Powerful yeah, they've grown in power since then. Maybe they don't have to listen so much. They're not concerned about that. That's a possibility. Maybe the walls are higher than they used to be. I don't know. <clears throat> right? You know what I noticed, though, about human nature? Is that the threat of destruction has a very short-lived efficacy. It doesn't work for very long. If, if, you, <clears throat> if you threaten destruction... I always um, advise parents never to threaten what they're not willing to, to fulfill, right? Because kids will every time call you on it. If it's not the first time, it'll be the next time. But th they'll find out, are they willing to go the distance? If you don't do that, you're going to have to sit at the table until you're old and gray. <laughs> Kids like I got no place to be, right? <clears throat> right? Are you willing to? I mean, you really have to consider. Are you willing to go the distance here, right? <clears throat> because what happens is, a threat is only has value, right? Until you become accustomed to the idea. I mean, the threat of jail time only usually works once. After that. Yeah, I pretty much know what to expect. Right. Not a big deal. Ah, been here before. Got the t-shirt or the tattoo. <laughs> right. You can't scare him with that anymore. You, you've been arrested? Ah, first time's always the hardest. After that, what? it's no big deal, right? Oh, I know what... I. Seen this happen. That's what happens with people. Fear is never a good long term motivator. It'll get you moving initially, but it won't keep you that. What happened the last time they were prophesied? There's going to be some great destruction, right? What happened? Nothing. Nothing happened. There was no big catastrophe. There was no. What do you think is going to happen this time? Probably nothing. Right? I mean, we tease about that stuff, don't we? The, uh, I, I, you guys know the uh, south of Livingston, Montana, is the Church Universal and Triumphant compound. Right? I don't know how much they still, uh, who's there anymore, but it used to be there was some crazy woman um, named Elizabeth Clare Prophet who prophesied the end of the world is coming, right? And for a long time in Livingston, and I don't know if they continue this tradition, they would celebrate end of the world day. Because it didn't happen. Right? And of course, the way you do that is by drinking. Because, I, 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 well, eat, drink, and be merry, I guess, for tomorrow. Or maybe next year. What's that? The Not the Kool-Aid, right? No, no, no. <clears throat> but well, we, we, we tease, we mock that, don't we? Because pff, nothing happened. She was full of hot air. Right? Well, what do you think the guys in Nineveh feel now? Nothing happened. God's not going to do nothing to us. Come on. Really? You be, do you believe that story? Guy got burped up by a fish. Really? Do you, do, you know that, do you know what the scientific odds are that that could really happen? I mean, <clears throat> anyway, who's around here who even saw it? Okay. Maybe they've got a big mound over there to Eunice, but, I mean, 
Do you believe that? Do you think that's true? Come on. Really? You're one of those? You believe the Eunice story? You, do you? There's no help. N no helping you hopeless fundamentalists. I just you, I can't, can't break through. Right? <clears throat> There's a lot of stuff that changes in there. But mankind's nature is pretty, pretty consistent. That, nah, you scare me once, but it's hard to do it twice. Hard to do it twice. A <clears throat> hundred years have passed, and, uh, <clears throat> and Nineveh's destruction is coming. And uh, God's going to tell them, uh, actually, how it comes. In verse 8, um, with an overwhelming, overflowing flood, he will make a complete end of its sight and will pursue his enemies into darkness. Um, uh, and it describes a little bit of their, uh, really the, um, if you've got little headings, uh, topical headings in your Bible, mine comes between verse 8 and 9. That actually should be between verse 7 and 8. Verse 8 is where he begins to talk about um, the destruction that Nineveh will undergo. In verse 9 he says, Whatever you devise against the Lord, he will make a complete end of it. Distress will not rise up twice like tangled thorns and like those who are drunken with their drink. They are consumed as stubble, completely withered. <clears throat> um, they are going to uh, be brought to an end indeed <clears throat> Uh, the way he's going to do that in verse 8 is with an overflowing flood. So, I, I find this interesting. Just, I don't know why they didn't see this coming, right? But Babylon, right, uh, falls because of, it's built on the Euphrates River, right? And, uh, and it's through that that the, that the Medes were able to sneak into the city, up through the city gates along by the river, after they diverted it, right? Um, Nineveh falls because it's built on a river too. So there's, uh, in 612 BC, the Tigris River massively overflowed its banks. And part of the wall crumbled. And the Babylonians took the opportunity, invaded through the breach in the wall, and they conquered the city in almost an instant. It's just, I mean, it's, it's just, it's like you're looking at the same, like a replay, like the movie's been remade. Like, uh, we've already seen this, we know how it ends, right? <clears throat> same thing happens, the, the, the walls crumble, um, that didn't happen, but the, the river was the, was the means by which they entered the city. The walls crumbled, opened up that breach, and the Babylonians um, went in through, that, uh, through the hole in the wall. But it uses uh, similar language, turn to... Uh, Turn to, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. oh, where did I put that? Uh, I know where I'm headed to. Mm -hmm. Oh, he even uses the same language to describe Nineveh um, in words that would be said later of Babylon. Oh, come on. Scanning, scanning, scanning. He, he, calls, um, he calls the city a harlot. Uh, it's right in front of me. I can't find it. Where is it? Wh what verse is it? It can't be that hard to find. Come on. Ah... Uh, <laughs> well, no. Yes, thank you, Matt. <clears throat> Chapter 3, verse 4. Uh, let's start in verse 1. Woe to the bloody city, completely full of lies and pillage. Her prey never departs, the noise of the whip, the noise of the rattling of the wheel, galloping horses, bounding chariots, horsemen charging, swords flashing, spears gleaming, many slain, a mass of corpses, countless dead bodies. They stumble over the dead bodies. All because of the many harlotries of the harlot, the charming one, the mistress of sorceries, who sells nations by her harlotries and families by 
by her sorceries. Behold, I'm against you, declares the Lord of hosts. I will lift up your skirts over your face to show the nations your nakedness and to the kingdoms your disgrace. I'll throw filth on you, make you vile, set you up as a spectacle, and it will come about that all who see you will shrink from you and say, Nineveh is devastated. Who will grieve for her? Where will I seek comforters for you? Turn to Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17 and verse 1, verse 2. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality, and those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her immorality. And he describes then this woman, right, sitting atop a beast full of blasphemous names, seven heads, ten horns, clothed in purple and scarlet. In verse 5, upon her forehead a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. Um, Babylon is described as that, but Nineveh is described in the same terms. What do the, what do the nations, what's their, what's their trade? What's the commodity in which nations do business? You know, when Revelation describes Babylon and all of her commerce, right? It's in violence, it's in spices, it's in gold, it's in all things valuable. And one more, human lives. There's a, there's a commerce of human lives. <clears throat> About Nineveh, it is said that... Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In verse 4, she sells nations by her harlotries and families by her sorceries. <clears throat> it's about power and it's about control. <clears throat> it's about influence and it's about being able to, to exert that influence over this people and that people. And people are bought and sold. Nations are traded. Families are sold and exchanged. The commodity right, <clears throat> on which so much power is based is the commodity of of human lives. Who will control what? Or who will control whom? Is a better question. Right? And you can see, you know, the, the world is not so different now because the nature of man has not changed. Right? There's still nations being sold, right? <clears throat> being bartered. This people for that people. Right? These, th this group for, for that land. These resources for those people. They get traded out. They get swapped all the time. Um, if I may be permitted a little bit of conjecture, um, what was the what was the price that um, uh, that we were that we were willing uh, to pay to uh, to give up a strategic asset in Afghanistan called Bagram Air Force Base? What, what, what was traded in order to get that done? It's a multi-billion dollar facility, strategically placed in, in, in the heart of angry land. So necessary to project force into the region. What was the cost? You know, you know what the cost was? We had to give up everyone in Afghanistan. We, we, Afghanistan was given back to the Afghans, right? Right. But the Afghans <clears throat> within the, the Afghan security forces within the space of about a week had been completely overrun by the Taliban. Because you can't import democracy. It don't work. Okay. But the Taliban in the weeks previous had been meeting with the communist Chinese who very much want the mountains in that region for their lithium deposits which are key in making lithium batteries. And they absolutely want that Air Force Base to project power in the region see, in order to ensure their Silk Road initiative. What got traded in, the mean, in all that? Because the Afghans aren't going to run that. They can barely run a hole in the ground. Okay? The communist Chinese, now that's valuable to them. What got traded? A lot of money went to politicians. A lot of money. 
a lot of lives. Anybody who worked with the U.S. was systematically hunted as soon as they were gone. And a list of those people had been forwarded to the Taliban. Well, they get out of it. People just traded. They traded all the time. They just get bought and sold for property, <clears throat> other things. There was a... Um, it, it, that's, that's the way the world works. It's just people. They're just a commodity. They get bought and they get sold. <clears throat> the U.S. is not a good ally. In, um, um, there were a bunch of prisoners of war um, after the Vietnam War and after Korea. And the U.S. knew about them but wouldn't publicly state that they were aware. But reports continued to trickle back in to the U.S. <clears throat> down flyers or people who had photos and so on and so forth. And they knew they were there. But when it became advantageous to recognize Vietnam as a country and, and reinstate diplomatic relations, they had a great inquiry, right? John McCain, if my memory is correct, <clears throat> was in charge of that. Their job was to gather up all the, all the information and determine whether or not those reports were true. And they gathered up all that information. And, and John McCain himself was a prisoner of war. So, so his word would have, would have the, the ring of truth to it, right? And they decided that all those guys, nope, there was nothing to those records. They were all destroyed. And they cut all those guys off. At that point, they were of no more value to the North Vietnamese to hold any longer. And they liquidated those assets. They're just sold. They're just bought and sold. They're just, it's just a commodity. What do you think's coming over the southern border right now? It's just a commodity. They're just, they're just, it's just a, it's just a currency. It's a means of exchange. Right? Just people being bought and sold. People being moved here, people being taken there. That's the way the world works. <clears throat> That's the way power is, is projected. They're just a commodity. They sell nations by their har harlotries, families by their sorceries. The Lord says, I'm against you, declares the Lord of hosts. The U.S., if my, um, if, if my information is right, the U.S. is now the number one consumer of um, child pornography and of um, uh, sex slavery. We, we used to be behind uh, Thailand and others, but that's changed in the last five to ten years. Where's that coming from? It's just people. We're just trading them out. It's just commerce. Just commerce. In chapter 3, verse 11, he says, uh, You too will become drunk. You too you will be hidden. You too will search for a refuge from the enemy. Um, Nineveh would indeed be hidden. Um, in fact, it wouldn't be until 1842 that the records of, uh, uh, of the city uh, were located and the city itself was identified passed over for a long time, scholars thought that the Assyrian Empire hadn't actually ever existed because it was so completely hidden and forgotten. Um, but uh, in 1842, it was discovered again, identified, and, uh, and the scriptures were um, validated, which I always appreciate. In, uh, uh, let's see, we read those, but Israel is going to be um, in chapter 1, verse 14, the Lord has issued a command concerning you. Your name will no longer be perpetuated. 
I will cut off idol and image from the house of your gods. I will prepare your grave, for you are contemptible. Behold, on the mountains, the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace. Celebrate your feasts, O Judah. Pay your vows. Never again will the wicked one pass through you. He is cut off completely. <clears throat> oh, won't that be nice when Nineveh is gone, right? Well, Judah lives under the shadow of the Assyrian Empire, right? Um, we've talked about Hezekiah before and how Assyria had made several incursions down into the territory of Israel and Judah and gobbled up a bunch of those cities. Jerusalem had, uh, had st stood fast only because of the Lord's miraculous divine intervention. <clears throat> the Assyrians were repelled, but finally, to hear that they will be destroyed and gone, that is good news. Right? That is that is exciting <clears throat> to think that on the on how blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> those the feet of him who brings good news, who announces peace. So celebrate your feast, Judah, and pay your vows. Never again will Assyria, the wicked one, right, pass through you. He'll be cut off completely. He says, the one who scatters has come up against you. This is chapter 2, verse 1. Man the fortress, watch the road, strengthen your back, summon your strength. The Lord will restore the splendor of Jacob like the splendor of Israel, even though devastators have devastated them and destroyed their vine branches. And then he talks about uh, Nineveh's destruction. <clears throat> uh, there's a particular line in there. I think it probably caught your attention. Did you notice it in verse 15? I mean, it's the, it's the great pronouncement that there's, there's going to be peace, hooray, right? Nineveh is destroyed. It's like ding dong, the witch is dead, right? There's finally, ah, uh, phew, we're out from underneath that, uh, that evil Nineveh. I know it makes you want to sing it, doesn't it? <clears throat> right? it? We're out from underneath Nineveh. Finally, no more Nineveh coming down here. Won't pass through the land. Uh, now that is good news, right? Liberated from the threat of Assyrian encroachment. In uh, Romans chapter 10. Romans 10. Paul asks this great rhetorical question from Naaman chapter 1, verse 15. No, Romans 10, in verse 13. Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And that certainly is good news. How then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings of good things. That should be translated differently in my opinion. Bring glad tidings of good things. Um, the word, um, or, uh, if, we're, if we're trying to bring that into, into English in a, in a way that's more consistent with the scripture, bring glad tidings is to speak, right, of good things. The word for good news is gospel, right? So bring glad tidings should literally be preach the gospel. And you may even have a little alternate translation note there in your, in, your, uh, in your Bible. I don't know, maybe the Spanish just does it right the first time. Is that right? Oh, I thought so. <clears throat> right? However, verse 16, they did not all obey the gospel, that is, heed the glad tidings. How beautiful, he quotes in verse 15, are the feet of those who bring glad tidings of good things. Wouldn't you like to hear that Nineveh had fallen. I mean, imagine when that hit the newspapers, right? I mean, people's phones would be buzzing all over the place. <clears throat> Did you hear? Did you hear about Nineveh? Did you hear about Nineveh? I heard about Nineveh. The Tigris, no way. Yeah, and the wall, and in came the Babylonians, and Nineveh's over. The Assyrians are done. They're finished. They're through. We're no longer under Assyrian, you know, uh, I don't, not quite occupation, but we're not, we're not, we don't have to live beneath their shadow anymore. They're over. Well, that would be good things, wouldn't it? Well, the good things of which Paul is referring, to which he refers in Romans chapter 10, <clears throat> are even better than Nineveh has fallen. I mean, Nineveh fallen, that's good. <clears throat> but what about the gospel message? That's better. I mean, don't tell the guys in Judah, but Nineveh falls in 6 
612 <clears throat> BC. Um, and by that time, uh, Babylon is already beginning its incursion south. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it, it, they really don't get much of a reprieve. It's just like Nineveh all over again, right? But how beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings of good things? How beautiful are they that <clears throat> preach the gospel? That <clears throat> the tyrant is no more. That there's liberation. That there's freedom. For all who call upon the name of the Lord. How beautiful indeed are the feet of those who bring glad tidings of good things. <clears throat> the message, he says in Nahum chapter 1 verse 15, is a message of peace. Brings good news who announces peace. In Ephesians chapter 2, it is that message. In Ephesians chapter 2, in verse 17, it says, He came and preached peace to you who are far away, and peace to those who are near. That itself is a quote from Isaiah 57, verse 19, if you're curious. <clears throat> and in chapter 2 of Nahum, um, chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, he says, He's going to strengthen and restore the splendor of Jacob like the splendor of Israel, even though devastators have devastated and destroyed their vine branches. The Lord never, ever ever, 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 ever forgets his people. Ever. No matter what happens, <clears throat> Nineveh rises, Nineveh falls. Babylon steps in to fill the vacuum. Right? Babylon rises, Babylon falls. The Persians rise, the Persians fall. The Greeks rise, the Greeks fall. The Romans rise, the Romans fall. God never abandons his people. The nations trade them like commerce back and forth. But God never abandons his people. And that is definitely good news. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we are so grateful that we can put our trust in you. Lord, the nations rise and fall and uh, Father, that doesn't happen without your notice. You've established their boundaries and, <clears throat> and, and their, their lifespans. Um, uh, and Father, we, we, we recognize that, uh, that you are the sovereign king over all things. Um, what a tremendous blessing it is um, to know that um, we will not be forsaken, not be forgotten, um, not be left uh, but that, that you are concerned, you are concerned about, about us, us and, uh, and, um, um, and we are not we are lost, lost in your sight. Your sight. Father, we're Father, thankful, we're thankful for, that, for that. Pray, Lord, pray, Lord, Lord that you help, help us in that confidence to have courage, courage to, uh, to, uh, to, do, to do our part, part each day, each day uh, um, to, bring to bring glad tidings, glad tidings of good things, good things to those, those um, um, who are who as, as yet under, under, under the, the threat, the threat shadow, shadow of the world. world. Father, help, Father, us, help to, us to, to be to a source, source of light, of light for them in, as in a dark, in a dark place, place that, that they would see, see the light, the light, the gospel, the glory of Christ, of Christ and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and be willing to obey, obey those, those glad tidings. tidings. Father, ask Father, that you watch over us as we go from here. Thank you for our time together tonight. Father, we love you. Love you and pray that pray that uh, what we do is we do in your sight, your Jesus, 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 Amen. Amen. Amen.